It's pretty rare to get news about A Song of Ice and Fire these days, and it's even rarer to unearth history that has been lost for a very long time. But Reddit user GSteph has done both. Through his research at a college library, he has unearthed several drafts of A Feast for Crows and of A Dance with Dragons that contain a slew of unpublished material. There's a ton of interesting details there, many of which could be their own videos. But today I wanted to go into one specific story that occurs in this uh, old draft of A Feast for Crows, as I think it's quite interesting and is a good glimpse at a history that we really don't know much about yet, uh, that being the history of Melis the Monstrous and the War of the Nine Penny Kings. So to give some context on this passage specifically, it takes place in Tyrion III, A Feast for Crows. You might know that Tyrion doesn't appear in A Feast for Crows in the published version. This was what would be Tyrion III, A Dance with Dragons. In that chapter, he meets young Griff and the entire Aegon camp and sits in on one of young Griff's lessons about the history of Volantis. However, in the original text, this was not a history of Volantis, but rather a history of Melis the Monstrous and the War of the Nine Penny Kings. It was changed or removed for some reason, which we'll get into when I discuss it at the uh, later half of this video. But for now, I'd like to just go through and read it uh, as it's quite interesting, and I'd love to get more people to see it and hear more people's thoughts on it. It's also worth noting that the entirety of this passage is available in the uh, Reddit post that I've linked in the description. I would encourage you to check it out, follow along, and look at all the other details there, because there are a ton of really interesting developments. So yeah, jumping into it, we arrive partway through this lesson as it's occurring on the deck of the Shy Maid. By the time they turned to history, young Griff was growing restive. We were considering the Band of Nine, said Halden. We're a Band of Eight with Hugor, the boy said. Well, seven and a half, at least, said Tyrion, and young Griff laughed. Hald and a half maester was less amused. The band of nine is our concern today. Tell me what you know of their formation. They met beneath an apple tree in the disputed lands, the lad replied. Golden tongue brought the ten of them together. There were golden apples on the tree, and the windfalls scattered on the ground. But the choicest fruit was out of reach until golden tongue had Melee's blackfire boost him up. Standing on the monster's shoulders, he plucked down ten apples, one for each of them. We could pluck ten golden crowns just as easily, he said, but only by standing on each other's shoulders. Elsewise, we might content ourselves with whatever wormy, half-rotted apples may fall to us. Eight of them were swayed by his words, but the ninth only laughed. Lamaud Lachere was his name. He was called the Lord of Battles, for his company had never been defeated in the field. Make all the pacts you want, he told them. I'll still defeat each of you in turn. But Spotted Tom said, Not if we kill you here, all of us together. They drew their swords and cut him down and buried him beneath the tree. With bloody hands they made their pact, swearing to be faithful to one another until each of them had won a kingdom. Maps were brought forth, and the world was carved up like a side of beef at a harvest feast. Excellent, said Halden. And can you name the nine who swore that oath beneath the tree of crowns? Tyrion might have come up with six or seven if pressed. Two of them had been pirate chieftains, Golden Tongue a merchant. The others had all led free companies in the disputed lands, and fighting endless, inconclusive battles for the greater glory of Tyrosh, Mir, or Lys. In Westeros, only Maelys the Monstrous was well remembered. But young Griff knew them all. The Pirate Queen, Old Mother, the Ebon Prince, Zobar Koha. Sonar of San named himself the last Valyrian. Spotted Tom the Butcher of the Maiden's Men, Sir Derek Fossaway, the Bad Apple, Rogo the Red Jester of the Jolly Fellows, the Basilisks, Kozo Zomarek, Alex Adras of Tyrosh, the Golden Tongue, and Melis Blackfire called the Monstrous who claimed the Iron Throne of Westeros. They all sound monstrous to me, said Halden. Why did Melis have that name and not the others? He devoured his brother in their mother's womb, and came forth malformed. His chest and arms were huge, and a second head grew from his neck no bigger than a fist. They say his strength was frightful, that he could uproot small trees with one hand, and when he fought for the right to lead the Golden Company, he slew his cousin's destrier with a single punch, uh, then twisted Damon's head until it tore off his shoulders. There was another reason, said Halden. What was it? You would think the superfluous head would be enough, mused Tyrion. It was rather a pity that his own siblings had not taken after Melis and his brother. If Cersei were no more than a boil on Jaime's neck, he would have been the handsome brother. No man is as monstrous as the Kinslayer, said young Griff. Melis slew his cousin, and then his only son, a boy of four. The Blackfires owned a clutch of dragon's eggs. 
Melis wanted a dragon to carry him to the Iron Throne, but the eggs were old and dead. When Samara San made him a gift of some old Valyrian scrolls, Melis read that king's blood could wake dragons out of stone, so he gave his son Maynar to the fire. The rite failed, though. The eggs did not hatch. Not for him, thought Tyrion. Not for nine mages, nor Baylor the Blessed, nor any of the others, till Daenerys. Tell me, Halden asked his charge, what do you believe caused the downfall of the Band of Nine? A sword, young Griff pushed a lock of bright blue hair out of his eyes. The one bearsed in the bold thrust through the heart of Melis the Monstrous. That was the end of them. Only so far as the Seven Kingdoms are concerned, Halden insisted. Another half year of hard fighting followed before the Stepstones and Disputed Lands were won back, and Alquo Adaris uh, maintained his rule of Tyrosh for six more years after that. He was poisoned by his queen, Tyrion put in. Never trust a woman, lad, especially a queen. The half maester gave him a dark look. Let's put love aside with Sir Barristan's sword. History is a garden. We are easily distracted by the fruits and flowers, but it is the roots that matter. If Selmy had not slain Melis, another would have claimed that honor. Westeros has never lacked for swords. He turned to Tyrion. Perhaps Yolo can answer that question. Tyrion rocked back and forth upon his stool. The fools were doomed before they'd half begun. In Westeros, your band of nine were called the Nine Penny Kings. The Tyroshi are selling crowns for nine a penny, I hear, the Prince of Dragonflies is reported to have said as he heard of their pact. They were never as formidable a combination as they appeared. Pirates and sellsword captains are not the stuff of kings. They conquered the Sepstones in the Disputed Lands, young Griff argued. Mir and Lys paid them tribute, and they put Golden Tongue on the throne of Tyrosh. They took Tyrosh by deceit, and word I'm not going to say so I don't get demonetized it. Golden Tongue's own kingdom, yet he proved powerless to stop his brother kings from despoiling it and selling half its children into slavery. It is one thing to wield the sword, another to wield the scepter, Halden Halfmaester told the lad, and the long ages of the world may conquer, may prove in that to our sorrow. Tyrion said, the Nine Penny Kings planted the seeds of their undoing, even as they were dividing up the world beneath their tree of crowns. The Ebon Prince urged the drawing of lots to determine who would get his kingdom first, but Golden Tongue insisted that they start where they were the strongest. This made good strategic sense, but meant that some of the Nine must wait years for their turn, so envy set in from the start. Half of them were treacherous by nature, and all Nine shared the fatal lack. They had no legitimacy. Kingdoms have been won by the sword, but not often by the sword alone. A king needs the support of his lords and people. Without it, the kingdom is built on sand. None of the Nine Penny Kings had any claim to the land they wished to rule. Melis the Monstrous did, young Griff insisted. He was the blood of the dragon, an unbroken male descent from the first Daemon Blackfire and King Aegon IV. Ah, but Daemon was Aegon's natural son, a bastard. The king legitimized him, though. He gave him Blackfire. The lad knows his Westerosi history. The sword was not the kingdom. Only the first Blackfire pretenders ever came close to success. Each failed rebellion only made their claim that much weaker. In Westeros, Melis was seen as a monster from across the sea. Not a rightful king come home. A risk that Daenerys Targaryen runs as well. Does she? Young Griff asked Holden. To some extent, the half maester allowed. Like the latter Blackfires, she had been raised in exile and comes to Westeros a stranger. But the queen has dragons, and none of the Blackfire pretenders could ever make that claim. And the Dragon Queen is beautiful, while Smaelis was malformed and hideous, added the dwarf. Men love beauty and hate ugliness, my lord. He grinned and pinched young Griff on the cheek. So best take care of that pretty face of yours, and see that no one cuts your nose off. This is an incredibly interesting passage for a number of reasons. So we don't really have very much history about the Band of Nine in general. What we do have is very much from a Westerosi perspective, and as is brought up in this passage, we really don't know that much about the claimants other than Melis the Monstrous, as he's the main one that Westeros is concerned with. However, this gives a lot more perspective on who exactly the other Nine Penny Kings were, why they fought, and how this fight actually went for them. And I really like that as an added bit of history. What's more, it kind of adds to an era of history that Martin has pretty much deliberately left as fairly vague, as he seems to have left most, much of the latter uh, Blackfire Rebellions to uh, be a mystery for the later Duncan Egg books, which are, are hopefully going to be published someday, though that seems less likely. Uh, and this does seem like something that could end up coming up in Fire and Blood Part 2, which he said you might call Blood and Fire. Though it's worth noting that this is entirely non-canonical until that would to be the case. So, as of present, this is a cool hypothetical history, but it's not something that is necessarily canon to the series as it currently stands. 
It's quite interesting to analyze why this might have been cut in the first place. It does seem like very obvious foreshadowing to Aegon VI being a Blackfire, and it does seem like from this, he might actually know that he's a Blackfire. Though it is good to note that this is completely non-canonical and does not apply to the main story as a whole. It does seem like in the main story that he is unaware of himself being a Blackfire, as well as John Connington being unaware of this. Uh, additionally, I think that it could have been removed to remove parallels to the Santa story, because I think it was pretty intentional foreshadowing with the waking dragons from stone and the sacrificing a child with king's blood to Stannis' eventual burning of Shireen. I think that is an event that's already been very foreshadowed in the story as it exists, uh, and I think that this might just be a little bit too heavy-handed for Martin's taste, so it would very much make sense to remove this in order to better keep the surprise, but still keep the light foreshadowing towards this. And I do think that this would be something that will probably become canonical, just if Fire and Blood is ever uh, given a sequel after the Winds of Winter and after Stannis has done this. I do think that this history is likely to remain unchanged, as it is quite cool and quite interesting. At least I hope it's unchanged, because I just tend to like uh, getting more history in general. So this was a very welcome surprise from Reddit user G Steph. So yeah, this has been the passage from Tyrion's uh, unfinished chapters from the Feast for Crows prologues. Uh, what do you think of these sections? What do you think they could mean for the future? Are there any other parts of this uh, essentially discovery that you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I have a video coming on Sunday as regularly scheduled about Rickon and about Skagos. That'll have more editing. That'll be more in-depth. This is just more of a quicker discussion type video because I thought this was pretty interesting. So yeah, I uh, thank you all for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And yeah, I will see you all on Sunday or as soon as uh, is possible in the future.